Chapter 12 Not bad for a sudden and uncontrollable GPS reconfiguration. Goodbye, Green Mountains. Hello, California. I would have thought myself inclined to never stop screaming. But I underestimated myself. Sure. I wanted to back out the rabbit hole. I wanted the man dead for the first 24 hours. But homicide was only a thought. Violence was not second nature to me. Not in these times. Not yet. I got away on a technicality. I guess we both did. We went to a gathering of thieves and whores. Jesus wasn't there. The whores called themselves escorts and the thieves called themselves survivors. They all could have owned the audition. Rare was a smile. Expect to hustle or be hustled. I expected to feel out of place, but I didn't completely. I kept my mouth shut and let Freddy do the talking. He acted as though I wasn't even there. They all did. He did not introduce me around, and I was slightly offended. Some chick named Uma was bending his ear about a problem with her car, and he listened and kept repeating, mm-hmm, about 20 different times while she went on and on about her troubles, working creases into Freddie's forehead. Then she asked what he thought, and he said, Sounds like the alternator. Much later, I'd come to learn that he always had one-liners for a woman with a car who wanted it fixed and wanted to know what was wrong, who had no intention of ever hiring or paying anyone to fix it, just expected handouts. Uma was no ordinary chick. She was bossy because she could be. She wasn't going to let it go at the alternator. The conversation between them continued. Yeah, you think so? The alternator, she said, walking about the room, attending to this or that, looking for her keys so she could give them to him. Maybe, Freddy. Well, I'll make some coffee if you want some. I got to go look for Shelly because she hasn't been home. And Dan, he's asking about her. He wants to see her, you know, but she can be so hard to find. She does it on purpose. Huh. Freddie said, non-committal. Well, I'm so glad you came. And what's with that other business we talked about, Freddie? I took care of it. You did? Because I just got a call from him, not even yesterday. Uma, I took care of it. Yeah? Really? Oh, great. That's great. What a case of nerves. I was grossly unimpressed and slightly jealous. All her questions, rapid fire at him. Couldn't she lay off? Her rhetoric was stale. She kept on foaming about the mouth with juicy or not so juicy gossip. Tried to make tentative plans for him to take a look at her beat up old Pontiac. Both of them seemed to lock down a time and a place, but I noticed that neither of them actually made note of it, unless it was mental. Freddie realized I was staring at him, and he looked back first to make sure she was gone. She was. She had walked out the apartment, and we could hear her outside talking and venting on some other poor soul out there. He looked back at me and smiled when he saw the look of disbelief on my face. Don't worry. We won't be here much longer, boo, he told me. I wanted to walk away from the scene, but I didn't. Where was I going to go? Nobody else in the room was interested in me. I may as well have been a rotary phone or an old desktop computer. They were all lost in talk about this or that scandalous person, place, or thing with various levels of feeling, sometimes dropping their voices down to a baritone of pent-up frustration or even clear resentment, getting quieter and then louder. And the women became cautiously pessimistic so not to offend the men and would try and lighten the conversation or spice her up, move her in a different direction, which sometimes rolled the dish over into a crescendo of re-engagement about this or that. Usually something the women who knew the men might know to be of interest to them to turn their mood back up.